All right, y'all. Welcome back to, uh, I guess this is week nine of uh, this, this semester. And to, today we're going to be diving even deeper into discrete probability distributions um, and discrete random variables. Okay, so the, uh, we're actually gonna be looking at a specific discrete random variable, one that's incredibly useful and um, really is some, you know, it, like I said, it, it's, it's really useful and common and uh, it's gonna seem so, sort of complicated, but you'll quickly discover how useful it is. So let's dive right in. What we're gonna be talking about today is the binomial probability distribution, okay? So the idea that you wanna keep in your head throughout the entirety of this lecture is you wanna think about coin flips, okay? So you wanna imagine that you're interested in how many heads you'll get out of a series of 10 coin flips. What sort of, what is the structure of the underlying probability distribution that determines how many heads you're likely to get within 10 flips. That's sort of the idea here. We're gonna look at numerous examples as we go forward, but they will all be examples of what we call binomial probability distributions. So first what we need to do is define what a binomial experiment is. Um, so a binomial experiment has a few uh, characteristics that uh, they all have the same characteristics, which is that first, there's a fixed number of trials. Okay, so again, we're thinking about coin flips generally. So that means there's going to be 10 coin flips or 20 coin flips, but however many there are, it's fixed. The next condition is that all of the trials are independent. So this is independence in the probabilistic sense that we learned in chapter five. Okay, so remember what independence means. So what independence means in a binomial experiment is that each coin flip has no effect. The probability of a, the probability of a certain outcome for a particular flip of the coin is not affected by the previous outcome or the, a future outcome. It is independent of all those outcomes. So that's what we mean in a binomial experiment, that the trials are independent. Think each coin flip has no effect on the other coin flip. The, another condition for binomial experiments is that for each given trial, there are only two distinct possibilities, okay? So think heads or tails, only two distinct possibilities per coin flip. And finally, we say that a binomial exper experiment must have a fixed probability of success. So success is a, um, a good word for it, but I remember when I was first learning this, the word success sort of threw me off. What is a success? Well, the truth is that success is completely contextually defined. What does it mean for there to be a success in your given experiment? Does it mean that you get a heads or does it mean that you get a tails? That's up to you. You're the one who determines what it means to be successful in a given trial, okay? So in a binomial experiment, the probability of getting a certain success is fixed for all trials. So again, if we're thinking about coin flips, we're thinking the probability of getting a heads, for instance, if that's what we define as success, the probability of getting a heads is always 0.5 for each trial, it never changes, okay? So if we have a binomial experiment, then we can define a random variable X that counts the number of successes in a given many trials, okay? So if we define X as the number of successes in N many trials, where N is the total number of trials, so N could be 10, 20, 30, whatever, then this X is what we call a binomial random variable. It's counting the number of successes in N many trials, okay? So we're gonna be doing a lot of work with X, big X, the binomial random variable. 
just to lay some groundwork here, we have some notation we need to go over. So the first is that uh, <clears throat> the lowercase letter n denotes the total number of trials in the experiment. The lowercase p denotes the probability of success. Okay, so for a coin flip, p would be 0.5. 1 minus p, which is the complementary probability, therefore denotes the probability of failure. So if we're thinking about coin flips, then p is the probability of getting a heads, for instance, and 1 minus p is probability of getting a tails. And so finally, just as I said up here, capital X, which will be equivalent to counting, uh, will be a random variable that counts the number of successes in n many trials. And this is our binomial random variable. Okay, so let's look at a couple examples. So what you will first need to be able to do is identify when you have an actual binomial experiment versus when you don't have a binomial experiment. We can't have a binomial random variable without a binomial experiment. So let's look at these few uh, examples and see whether or not we have binomial experiments. So let's say we have a basketball player who historically makes 80% of his free throws. We then set up an experiment where we ask him to uh, shoot three free throws back to back and we count the number of free throws that he made in that given experiment, okay? So we want to see whether or not this is a binomial experiment. So let's see if we have all the conditions. The first condition is that there should be a fixed number of trials. There are three free throws, so n will be three. So that gives us one of the, uh, one of the conditions. The next is that all of the trials are independent. And uh, <clears throat> for the most part, we can say that each throw of the ball, of the basketball, is independent from its previous throw. They don't affect one another. So independence, check. The next is that we need two mutually exclusive options per trial. What are the outcomes? Are there more than two? Are there less than two? Well, no, he can either he can either make the shot or not. So that is two options. And then finally, we need a fixed probability of success. Well, in this case, the probability of success was determined empirically based on this player's stats. And so we are told to think or expect that the probability of success will be 80%, which is indeed fixed. So all of this together tells us that we have a binomial experiment. Okay. Now let's look at this second example. In this example, we are drawing three cards from a deck without replacing them. We then count the number of aces drawn out of those three cards. The question is, is this a binomial experiment? Okay, first, are there a fixed number of trials? In this case, yes. N is three. Uh, are the trials independent of one another? Now, this is seemingly tricky, but you have to think about each independent draw of the card. Does the probability of um, one result affect the probability of another result? And the, in general, we'd say yes, because we are not replacing the cards. So when we take the first card out of the deck, 
we've removed one card from the deck, which means the probability of a certain outcome for the second draw will be different than it would have been had we not drawn first, the other card first. So the events are not, or the trials are not independent. Once you don't have independence, you know that you do not have a binomial experiment, but we could keep going. Uh, are there mutually exclusive options for outcomes? Yes, either it's an ace or not. And finally, is there a fixed probability of success? And here, the big answer is no. There is not a fixed probability of success for the same reason that we did not have independence. When we, if we pull an ace on the third card versus pull an ace on the first card, the probability of getting an ace will change because we're removing progressively removing cards from the deck after drawing them. So the probabilities of success are steadily changing, right? So if we, the probability of getting an ace on the first draw, for instance, would be four out of 52, or one out of 13. But a probability of getting an ace on the second draw could be a number of different things. Did we draw an ace first on the first draw? If we did, then the probability of success would be three out of 51. If we didn't draw an ace out of on the first draw, then the probability of success would be four out of 51. In either case, we see that none of these probabilities match each other. And so, this also fails to have a fixed probability of success and therefore is not a binomial experiment, okay? So this is something that you could be expected to do. I could hand you a scenario and you can be asked to evaluate whether or not you have a binomial experiment. Okay, so now it's time to get down to some math. Once you know you have a binomial experiment, you can then uh, simply define a binomial random variable. Once you have a random variable, oftentimes what you want to do with it is figure out certain probabilities of certain outcomes. In the case of the binomial probability distribution, there is a uh, well-known functional representation uh, of the possible probabilities. And that is <clears throat> what we call the binomial probability distribution function or binomial PDF, okay? Probability density function is also said. So binomial PDF, binomial probability distribution function, probability, binomial probability density function, all one in the same. So let's take a look at this critter and try to understand what's going on here. So this is a function, okay? Functions have inputs and outputs. The input for this function is lowercase x. Lowercase x is equal to the number of successes. So I input into the function how many successes I'm interested uh, in having. I wanna calculate the probability of a certain number of successes for a particular binomial experiment. So I, put, I input the number of successes into the function and then it spits out the probability of getting that many successes, okay? Now there's a few things going on here that we can see. I've defined what lowercase x is, it's the number of successes. Lowercase n, again, is the number of trials. And lowercase p is the probability of success, while 1 minus p is the probability of failure. OK, now there's more to unpack here before we can use this function and understand how to use it. I need to define a few things. The big thing that I, I really need to cover is what the heck is this? 
Okay, so you might have looked at that and thought it's a fraction, of course. But if you look closer, you'll notice there is no fraction bar. And in fact, this is not a fraction at all. Or it is a fraction, but it's a very special fraction. So this is a symbol. And this symbol represents what we call a uh, binomial coefficient. Coefficient, remember, is a number that multiplies a variable. So this, this thing we call the binomial coefficient, and it's just a symbol. It's not, not a fraction as written. The symbol translates into the following. Okay, so now this is a mathematical statement, whereas this was just some symbol. Now we actually have a fraction. Now, there's still more for me to define, obviously. We have this fraction and there's all these exclamation marks. What do these exclamation marks mean? The exclamation marks are what we call factorials. And they're very simple. So for n factorial, n exclamation mark, that is equivalent to n times n minus one times n minus two, all the way down to one. So you're multiplying all the numbers from n downward. That's what a factorial is. So here we have x factorial. So that would be x times x minus 1 times x minus 2 all the way down to 1. And then we have n minus x factorial, which we know that x will be less than n, less than or equal to n. And so this again is just counting down. So that's n minus x times n minus x minus one all the way down to one. Okay. So this is a, a rather complicated looking thing, but we'll see that in practice it actually simplifies quite a bit and it's not that hard to work with. It just looks bad when we write it out in symbols. Okay. So we will see how this thing works. And, and get a lot of practice with it. So don't sweat that yet, but just know what these things mean. This is a special symbol that tells us to form this fraction that's composed of these particular factorials. And the factorials are just multiplication of numbers starting at the number list uh, given and counting down. So we're just multiplying all the numbers, right? So just as a quick example, five factorial, it's five times four times three times two times one, which if we calculate it, is five times four times three times two times one is 120. Okay, so that's what a factorial is. And this, this symbol stands for a binomial coefficient here that's determined by taking these factorials and forming a fraction out of them, okay? So we will work with this momentarily, hang tight. First, I wanna go over some, <clears throat> some more notation here. So we will be calculating probabilities using this function and we can be asked to calculate any number of different probabilities and they usually have certain key phrases to look out for. So I, I did want to go over that really quickly. So we could be ca calculating uh, various probabilities and the phrases that you'll run into are some like this. So for instance, we could be asked to calculate the probability that we'll have at least X, little X, many successes. So then that's the probability uh, that big X is greater than or equal to little X. Remember, big X is the random variable. Little X is a number that we predetermined as the number of successes that we're interested in. So at least means greater than or equal to, okay? And this, for a discrete probability distribution, is simply the probability of X plus the probability of X plus one, all the way up to the probability of N, okay? We could have a statement like what the probability that there will be more than X many successes. In this case, 
that more than means a strict inequality. And here we would calculate by for starting at x plus one and counting up all the way up to n. Okay. Similarly, we can flip all this around. We could be asked that what will be the probability that there'll be less than x many successes. And so in this case, we're calculating the probability of zero up to x minus one. We could be asked to calculate the probability that there will be no more than x many successes or at most x many successes. In this case, we're counting up to x. And then the simplest case is calculating exactly many x, six, x many successes. And this is just using the function directly as written. So this is when big X equals little x. And that's all of, all of these little p, p of x, p of x plus one, those are all uh, exact probabilities where we're using this function as written, okay? So let's look at some examples. Okay, so in this, these examples are gonna have the same setup. We're told that 72% of all Americans would rather give up chocolate than give up their cell phone. Okay, we're, so we, we're gonna know that this is a binomial experiment. We're gonna select 10 people at random and find the probability that out of that 10, we could, for instance, ask what is the probability that there will be exactly eight out of the 10 that uh, would prefer to give up chocolate to their cell phones. So in this case, this is the probability that big X equals eight. Okay, so here we're using the probability uh, distribution function directly. So we need to know all of the bits and pieces. We know that N, which is the number of trials, is 10. We know that the probability of success based on the number they gave us is 0.72, okay? So with that, we're interested in x little x many successes, which is eight. So now we're just gonna fill in everything that we know. So that's 10 choose eight. I forgot to mention, that's how, you, how we read this binomial coefficient. We say 10 choose eight, 10 choose eight, then 0.72 raised to the x power, and then one minus 0.72 raised to the 10 minus X power. Okay. So let's see what is going on here. Now, I'm gonna show you how to do this, some of this with your calculator. So you're gonna, you're gonna be happy that I showed you how to do this. <clears throat> uh, to calculate this particular probability, this is how we do it by hand. I'll show you by hand first and then we'll show you with the calculator, okay? So 10 choose eight, remember is 10 factorial over eight factorial and then two factorial, eight plus two equals 10. To calculate the factorials, I could do them this way. I'm gonna say 10, I'll put down the 10, then I'll hit the math button. And I think it's here, there it is. I scroll over to the probability and scroll down and there's that exclamation mark. And so I can put that into the equation. 10 factorial over, now I'm gonna put the whole denominator, denominator in parentheses, and then we'll add some more factorials eight factorial and then two factorial, close parentheses. So I get exactly 45 out of that. So that whole coefficient is 45, okay? And then we'll have to figure out what these powers are. So just to find out the coefficient, that's equal to 45. So putting it all together, we'd have 45 
times 0.78 raised to the 8 power, no, 0.72, sorry, raised to the 8 power times 1 minus 0.72 raised to the 10 minus 8 power, which is 2, and then multiply that by 45. Okay, so <clears throat> this is our result. I just did most of it in the calculator because it would have taken up too much space here. So we end up with a probability of 0.2548, okay? So the probability of getting exactly eight people out of 10 that would prefer to give up chocolate, their cell phones is about 25.5%, okay? So that's how we use the uh, function directly. We can calculate the coefficients and then put these things in and multiply the three together and boom, you've got your answer. Okay. Now suppose that we would like to calculate the probability that there will be fewer than three people out of the 10 who would prefer to give up chocolate to their cell phones. So remember fewer than means that the big X is less than, strictly less than the little X. So this is the probability of zero plus the probability of one plus the probability of two, but excluding three, okay? So in order to really calculate this, we have to do this three times, right? Now, I will say this, that I, I may make you do all this by hand, but I'm gonna show you how to do it with your calculator, the quick way, okay? So there's a calculator function that I'll show you how to use, which is called binom PDF. And it takes in three inputs, NP and X, which are the same NP and X that we've been using and this will spit out the answer to P of zero or P of one or P of two, okay? So watch me closely. I'm gonna hit the second button, which is the blue button here. Then I'm gonna hit the VARS button here, okay? Second VARS, second VARS. I'm then gonna scroll down until I see the function binom PDF. That's what I'm gonna select, okay? Now, as I told you, the binom PDF takes in three inputs, N, P, and X. They must be in that order. Okay, so the, sorry, the N, which is the total number of trials, is 10. The P, which is the probability of success, is 0.72. And the X for this problem will change. So we need to calculate P0, P1, and P2. So if I want to calculate P0, I'll put a zero in the third slot. Hit enter and boom, it spits out a number. This is a very small number. It's to the 10 minus six power. It's a very small number. So what I can do now is calculate all of these results the same way. So I can bring the function back up and then just change out the zero for a one. And that will give me the probability of getting exactly one, and then I could do it again, and I could get the probability of two. They're all very small numbers, as you can see. So if I were to write this out, let me try to keep the calculator in the shot as best I can, okay. So here's, P0, P1, and P2. So that would be equal to 2.96 times 10 to the negative six plus 7.62 times 10 to the negative five plus 8.81 times 10 to the negative four. 
So that would be all the individual probabilities and all of those must be added up. Okay, so if we added all of those up, then I'll do it this way. I'll say zero, then plus second vars. So you can see me go through it a couple of times, binom PDF, N comma P comma X plus second vars. Scroll down, find on PDF, P or N comma P comma X. So if I add them all three together, we get 1.55, yep, 1.55 times 10 to the negative four. So a very small number. So 1.55, times 10 to the negative four. And that would be our answer. Okay, so the probability of having fewer than three people is pretty low, which makes sense because the probability, the individual probability was 72%. So to have, to, to have less than three out of the 10 that would, wouldn't prefer it is pretty low low probability, okay? Let me box this, this was the answer up here. All right, and then uh, a final example. Suppose that we want to instead calculate the probability of at least three, okay? So from what I showed you, this should be <clears throat> equal to the probability that big X is greater than or equal to three. But remember, I told you in chapter five, about at least probabilities. And these are best handled by using the complement rule. Now the complement rule in this discrete probability context takes on a slightly different form. So notice that I, the probability of X being greater than or equal to three is equal to one minus the complement, which is X is strictly less than three. So the complement of greater than or equal to three is less than three. So this is just like the complement rule. And what's great about this is I've already calculated P of X less than three. So that's 1.55 times 10 to the negative four. And so if we calculate that, We get 0.999, almost 100%. Okay, so we can use the basic probability distribution function to calculate all types of probabilities, as you can see. We can use our calculator to calculate the probability, uh, use to do the computation for us. That being said, you know that I like to make you do things by hand. And so I will expect you to be able to do it by hand and um, can show you more examples when that, that is needed, okay? Okay, so a few last things that we need to talk about, basic stuff here. So any random variable has a mean and a standard deviation. And so a binomial random variable is no different. In this case, the, a binomial random variable has a known and standard way of computing its mean and its standard deviation. So if X is a binomial random variable, then its mean mu of X, so subscript X is equal to N times P, where N is the number of trials and P is the probability of success. The standard deviation is given by the square root of n times p times one minus p, where remember one minus p is the probability of failure. So these are the straightforward formulas that we can use in any given instance. So if we say that n is equal to 300 and p is equal to 7.72, then for this particular random variable, our mean would be 300 times 0.72. Okay, 
300 times 0.72 is 216. So an average of 216. And the standard deviation is the square root of n times p, which is 216, times 1 minus p, Okay, so that's going to be the square root of 216 times 1 minus p, which is 0.18. So we get a standard deviation of 6.24. And that's as simple as that. Just straightforward applications of the formulas. We can get the mean and the standard deviation. So mean and standard deviation mean the same thing in this context as they did when we first learned about them. Mean is our sort of balance point in our distribution and the standard deviation gives us a sense of how, what the spread of the data is, how clustered, how spread out is it. Okay. Now <clears throat> there's a few basic observations that we need to make about the shape of the uh, binomial probability distribution. And there's really two parameters that we can play with. There's the number of trials and the probability of success. Those are the two things that we could vary. And depending on how they vary, we get some different uh, behavior, okay? So these first three graphs I'm showing you of the probability distribution, all have the same number of trials. So the number of trials has been fixed at five. However, for the three pictures, the probability of success is changing. Here, the probability of success is 0.2, here it's 0.5, and here it is 0.8. So what we see happening is that when the probability of success 